ഓം അജ്ഞാനതിരന്ധ്യ ജ്ഞാനാഞ്ജനശലാകായ ചക്ഷുരുന്മിലിതം യേന തസ്മൈ ശ്രീ ഗുരുവേ നമ നമ ഓം വിഷ്ണുപദായ കൃഷ്ണപൃഷ്ഠായ ഭൂതലെ ശ്രീമതെ ഭക്തിവേദാന്ത സ്വാമി നാമിനെ നമസ്തെ സരസ്വതി ദേവി ഗൗരവാണി പ്രചാരിണെ നിർവിശേഷ ശൂന്യവാദി പാശ്ചാത്യദേശതാരിണെ വാഞ്ചാകൽപതരൂഭ്യശ്ച കൃപാസിന്ധുഭ്യ പതീതാനാം പാവനേഭ്യോ വൈഷ്ണവേഭ്യോ നമോ നമ ജയ ശ്രീകൃഷ്ണ ചൈതന്യ പ്രഭൂ നിത്യാനന്ദ ശ്രീ അദ്വൈതഗദാധാര ശ്രീവാസാദിഗൗരഭക്തവൃന്ദ ഹരേ കൃഷ്ണ ഹരേ കൃഷ്ണ 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 ഹരേ 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 രാമ ഹരേ രാമ 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 ഹരേ 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 കൃഷ്ണ സോ ഓൺ ദി ഒക്കേഷൻ ഓഫ് വേൾഡ് മെന്റൽ ഹെൽത്ത് ഡേ വെൽക്കം ഓൾ ഓഫ് യു ടു ദിസ് ടോക്ക് ഓൺ മൈൻഡ്ഫുൾനെസ് ബേസ്ഡ് ഓൺ ഭഗവത് ഗീത ഇൻസൈറ്റ്സ് I'll talk about this in broadly three parts. Metaphors for understanding the mind. Then methods for managing the mind. And, and moods for understanding the mind's moods. So I'll talk about moods. So metaphors, methods and moods. so what is the mind when we talk about mental health what do we actually mean by it as our society has become more and more progressive it has progressed we have more and more physical comforts but there seems to be something wrong that we i have not become happier with the comforts that we have there is gold greater stress greater depression greater addiction even greater suicides so we are recognizing that well being extends beyond the physical i was in america a few months ago and there are devotees who work at the mayo clinic so i was speaking with speaking at, at that institute and there the discussion was about how more and more science is recognizing in mainstream medical science is recognizing that medicines physical medicines which are meant to cure people they can't cure as effectively unless people's mental health is sound so what does that mean that means that okay if there's something wrong in the body there's some acidity and we take some food and then that is meant to cure and that should cure but it doesn't cure if a person's mind is disturbed so when we talk about mental health or mental sickness what do we mean in the past mental sickness meant insanity and somebody has to be institutionalized put in a mental asylum but that is a very radical and very exclusive kind of understanding of mental health and mental sickness it is that mental health is a spectrum just like physical health is a spectrum that not everybody who is physically not so fit has to be immediately put in the hospital but anybody who is not physically so fit can function better if they become physically fitter so similarly mental health the, the more we improve it the more we become mentally fit so we could have three things there's mentally fit there's mentally unfit and there is mentally sick it's like we are physically fit physically unfit and physically sick so so when what does this mental health and mental fitness mean the mind the bhagavad gita explains is basically a tool it is a tool for perceiving when we want to perceive what is there in the outer world we perceive it through the mind and 
then we process it. We process it means we try to apply what we have learned. So to understand mental health, let's look at the one major metaphor, which is what I'll be using throughout this talk primarily. So here, yeah. So what is mental health? If you understand a health, uh, what is how do we define a healthy body? A healthy body is that which does what the body is meant to do. So with the body, we walk, we talk, we function. So when we are able to function properly, we say the body is healthy. Similarly, when we understand the mind is healthy, what does it mean? It does what it is meant to do. So let's look at this metaphor a little more clearly. That, as I said, there's a fit body. There is an unfit body. So when the body is fit, a person is efficient. They can do, do things and do them fast. When the body is unfit, they're inefficient in doing this. When they're sick, they're immobilized, they're in pain. So if you understand, the mind is an object of perception, is a tool for perception. So when the mind is fit, we see things clearly. When the mind is unfit, our perception becomes distorted. That means there's a problem, there may be a small problem, and we make it big. So our, our perception becomes distorted. And when the mind is sick, our perception is not just distorted, it becomes toxic. That means there may be a small problem, and we catastrophize it. We think that this is the, this is the end of my life, this is the end of the world, I am ruined because of this. So, when we want to promote mental health, that means we want to make our perception better. Uh, of course, the mind has functions other than perception also. I'm focusing on one over here, just to make the understanding clearer. So here, the metaphor we are discussing is the metaphor of, of a tool. If the body is a tool, it helps us to do things. When we're not able to do things, then the tool is not working properly. So same way, the mind is a tool and it's a tool for perception. It's like, say, if I consider these glasses, now, if the glasses are, there's a lot of dust or mud or any other stuff like that, then I can't see very clearly from the, from the glasses. Then um, I need to clean them. If I don't clean them, then I won't be able to see clearly. The more I clean them, the better I'll be able to see. So similarly, the mind needs to be clean. Cheto darpana marginum. Then we can see more clearly. So a, a toxic perception would mean what? The mind is filled with uh, biases, with prejudices, with uh, unhealthy cravings and passions. So a uh, person with a sick mind, for example, what happens? Sick mind becomes destructive, destructive for oneself, destructive for others. I suppose somebody is an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. An alcoholic, that person has a craving for everything they see in terms of alcohol itself. And how can I fulfill my craving for alcohol? Which a person may come home and that person is, they have some savings which are basically enough only for their meals for the family for the next few days. That person thinks, no, I want to, I want to drink. And no, we have less money. Can't you drink less? No. If you have less money, then you eat less. But I have to drink. That's sick mind. The sick mind just fixates on one thing and becomes blind to everything else. So everybody has problems in life. But sometimes some people become self-destructive. Some people become suicidal. Why do they become suicidal? Because, of course, suicide is a complex social phenomena. And there can be many causes. But ultimately, suicide is a tragic example of the mind literally killing the body. It is not that in most cases people are suicidal, they are so there's such a desolate physical state that they're starving and they're going to die. No, they end their lives because their mind is filled with negativity. Now, of course, there may be negativity in their life also, 
but their mind exaggerates the negativity. So this is the point that the mind that is perceiving things erroneously, that is an unhealthy mind. And the degree of the erroneous perception, degree of the false perception, misleading perception, that determines the degree of the distance of that mind from a healthy situation. So with this, with broad background, the, the Gita says the mind is a tool for perception. Shrotram chakshus parshanam cha rasanyam ghranam eva cha adhishtaya manaschayam vishayan upasevate that all the senses, normally that's what we consider the objects, uh, tools for perception. We see with our eyes, we hear with our ears, we smell with our, tongue, uh, with our nose. But actually, we don't just perceive with all these, we perceive with our mind. If our mind is absent, that means we're absent-minded. Even if our, the eyes see, we won't be able to see. So we, the mind is the central tool for perception. If I consider the palm, the five fingers of the hand, they're centered around the palm. So like that, the five senses of perception, the jnana indriyas, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the skin, we gain information of the outer world from all these. They're all centered around the mind. And like I give the example, if my eyes are not able to see either because there is something, some dust on the glass, or there is something in my eyes which is obstructing me in seeing. No. Uh, then we will immediately work to fix that. Mm -hmm. But when something is stuck in our mind, we don't even realize it. We hardly ever work to fix it. And that's how our perception gets blocked. And not just blocked, it becomes distorted. At least with respect to the eyes, when something is blocking our eyes, we don't see at all and we realize I'm not seeing. But with respect to the mind, when something comes in the mind, it doesn't just block our vision, it distorts our vision. We think we are seeing when we are seeing something different from the reality. So what do we do about it? How do we deal with it? So regarding that, the Gita talks about another metaphor for the mind. It says the mind is chanchala. Chanchala means restless. And restless. Let's understand this with one more metaphor now. That the mind is basically the link between the soul and the body. Yeah. You see this here? So the mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there can be distresses. So when this mental health becomes uh, problematic, when there are distresses in our life. I say the external negativity is there. Hmm? But external negativity, how we perceive it. Distresses, the challenge our mind is conceptions. Oh, I want to do this, but this has come happened. And the mind feels, oh, things are not working out right. What is the use of working? What is the use of trying? The mind tends to become unfit. But when disasters are there, they confound the mind. The mind thinks things have to happen this way. I mean, they don't happen that way. They are happening the opposite way. It just we feel sick. We feel like quitting. We feel like giving up. So in such a situation, what can we do? So just try to, let's try to understand the mind with one more metaphor before we try to see what is happening. The soul, the Gita explains that our existence is three level. The soul, the mind, and the body. So from the soul, consciousness comes out. The soul is the root. Root means source, R -O, o T. The soul is the root of consciousness. And there is the pathway through which the consciousness comes out. That is the route of consciousness. And the mind is the route of consciousness. And consciousness itself that is coming out, that is like the energy of the soul. And this comes out from here, comes through the body and goes into the outer world. So, to give an example, if we have, say, the flashlight. So, I have flashlight over here. Now, if you imagine I put this like this over here. So, now to the extent this is aligned, you can see the light clearly. 
Now, if this becomes like this, the light comes only slightly. If this becomes like this, imagine this, this hand will block it. And the, the, this is there, but light is coming very, very less. This has come if the light gets almost completely blocked. So basically, the soul is basically like this flashlight source. Soul is the source. And from here, the consciousness gets channeled through the mind. If I want to see something that is here, I need some light to see it. But if the light is going here, then I can't see much over there. So when the, if this is, the channel has become like this, when we say somebody is absent-minded, what that means is they are at a particular place, but their mind is absent. It's not present there. And that's why perception doesn't happen. So we don't perceive with our senses. We don't perceive with the eyes. We actually perceive with consciousness. And consciousness is channeled through the mind. So when somebody is routinely absent-minded, then that becomes a behavioral trait. But there are times when our passions, when our prejudices, they just distort our perception. That's mental health problems. That's when mental health problems begin. So the metaphor, so we are trying to see a particular thing, but the mind goes off somewhere else. So for example, we are facing some challenge. We have to do something which is difficult. Now part of our mind may say, it's too difficult. It's not going to work out. I'm not good enough to do this. I'm going to fail. Now when the mind starts thinking like this, what that means what is happening is, the mind is not looking at the exact the situation that is there in front of us right now. The mind is looking at, oh, maybe in the past I failed, maybe in the future I I'll fail. And in the present, what we could do, we don't do because of that. So the mind diverts our energy. And the sicker the mind, the more our energy gets diverted. So one characteristic of a healthy mind, we could say is that it focuses on what needs to be perceived. Imagine, just to give another example to illustrate this, that suppose we are going through a dark place and it's not a very smooth path. Sometimes there are rocks, sometimes there are marshes, sometimes there are some creepers of the branches uh, that are along the ground and just, you know, our leg may get stuck and we may fall. And we are walking through all of those. Now we have a flashlight. Our flashlight needs to be focused ahead so that we can say, Okay, I should take, put my foot over here. I should not put my foot over it. But suppose something came along and started moving our flashlight everywhere. Rapidly. It's just moving rapidly, 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 rapidly. Now we want to see ahead, but if the flashlight is moving like this, how will we see? We won't be able to function. So for us, our the consciousness is like that light coming from the flashlight. But the mind is like some other person and just coming and constantly shaking our hand, shaking our hand, shaking our hand. So because of the mind, the mind just keeps being restless, going here, going there, going there. And it just comes up with its own imagination, its own stories of what is happening. It doesn't allow us to perceive things properly. So this is why to the extent the mind is restless, going like this, like chanchala, chanchala, to that extent, our perception becomes unclear. To that extent, we become sicker. So we become mentally sicker. And what is the solution to this? How do we deal with such sickness of the mind? This is where the Gita uses another metaphor. And that metaphor is the metaphor of a child. Chanchala also refers to one who is restless. And children are restless. Frequent children are restless. So the Gita says that we are all having a mind which is like a child. And because it is like a child, it tends to go everywhere. To the extent it goes to this place, that place, and all places, to that extent we remain incapable of functioning effectively and if we want to function we need to treat the mind like a child who needs to be 
what do we with the child if we have a child who is very restless who is very mischievous now we can't just force the child to go away it's our child and we need to deal with the child so krishna uses two words abhyasa and vairagya abhyasa and vairagya so abhyas refers to practice and vairagya refers to detachment these two terms they can have many different meanings but we will discuss one specific meaning over here so there is with respect to dealing with the mind there are two things that are required there is abhyasa krishna the way krishna explains it is it is fencing We, if we have a child, and the child is often getting into trouble, so how do we get the child out of trouble? We have to we have to keep a watch on the child. But one way we keep on the watch is that okay, if we are we have a house, we make sure that our, our house has a fence. Like if some simple like small children, they baby fence their house. They baby, uh, baby protect their house. Why baby protect? Because otherwise the child. will natural run here there everywhere and we can't stop the child from running but if we have a fence okay you cannot go this side you know what i'm saying so fencing protects the child so one aspect is fencing and the other aspect is feeding you want the child to grow up then what do we need we need to help the child grow up to get its healthy food by which it will grow up in a healthy way so abhyasa and vairagya that is what krishna talks about let's try to understand these two terms through a example over here yeah so a mother when she is taking care of the child she feeds the child feeding the child will help the child to grow in a healthy way and so children are is as immature but as they grow they biologically grow they are fit they are healthy then they also grow up and they understand okay child is a small child the child may just want to play here and there but the child grows mature the child realizes okay i have to study i have to have a good life in the future i need to have the priorities and fencing is what protects the child from things which are dangerous so there may be strangers who may come and attack the child there may be somebody else make you some food which will be harmful to the child so there to be protection so if we take these two points in mind what happens is what does becoming mindful mean what are the gita's insights that we practice practice means what is good for us so instead of saying oh my mind always thinks negative you know oh, my mind is always distracted So thinking like that, okay, practice. Okay, as soon as I realize that my mind is thinking negative, make it try to direct in the positive direction. As soon as we feel lethargic, okay, try to think of something which will give us energy, and try to do that. So practice. So the the good thing about the mind, it's mechanical. Uh, mechanical means that whatever is put into it, that's what it will bring out. So it's. it is there may be garbage inside garbage will come out there is goodness inside goodness will come out so we just need to repeat and that is why traditions across the world have rituals in the bhakti tradition there are many rituals now sometimes the word ritual has had a negative connotation oh we are just doing rituals mindlessly uh, the word ritualistic has a negative connotation but many athletes and achievers in today's world world are recognizing the importance of rituals so there are books about daily rituals for success the idea of ritual is ritual means that we do an activity repeatedly and that puts us in a particular state of mind so our actions affect our emotions our emotions affect our actions there's a link between the external and internals so rituals are external practices 
which can put us in a particular frame of mind, which can help our mind to move towards a particular way of thinking and functioning. So, for example, suppose as a cricket player, maybe a champion batsman. Now, before the batsman goes for batting, uh, they often have certain rituals. Now, when they're going to over batting, they'll put first maybe the right pad and the next pad, left pad, and they'll put the bat in a particular way, swing the bat, maybe do some movement of the hands, and then they have to go for batting, and then look up at the sky. Then when they step across, the first step they put is the right step across the boundary line. And so now what is they doing? This is not just for stash, fashion or style. Actually, those rituals, they help the mind Okay, now I'm going for I'm going for batting. This is important. Let me be the best. Let me perform the best way I can. So there are actions which can help us put ourselves in particular states of mind. So this same principle is tapped since time immemorial within the bhakti tradition. And there are certain practices that are given. And those practices help the mind grow up, help the mind calm down help the mind focus. So among the various practices, the, the, it is said that the, we can direct the mind in various ways. But if we direct the mind toward the highest reality, that is the fastest way for the mind to grow up. Children will grow up at their own pace. You cannot give artificial growth hormones and make a child grow from one year to 10 years in one year. We try that in, with animals and we try in, in factory farms, in basically slaughterhouses, pre slaughterhouse stage where the animals are kept alive. They're giving artificial growth hormones, so that they grow up rapidly, but that leads to a lot of diseases. So, whereas the biological growth of the body cannot be accelerated, the growth of the mind can be accelerated. So, and how is it accelerated? The size of the mind depends on the size of the object in the mind. So the bigger the object in the mind, the bigger our mind becomes, the faster the mind grows. And the biggest object is the supreme object, is the supreme reality. That is, that is described in the Bhakti tradition in the Bhagavad Gita as the all-attractive divinity, Krishna. So... All the yoga traditions, all the various yoga paths are meant to calm the mind and direct it towards higher reality. Bhakti yoga, among the various yoga traditions, starts by giving access to the highest reality. So when we chant the holy names of Krishna, when we behold the deity of Krishna, when we hear the wisdom of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, what we are doing is exposing our mind to the highest reality. And that exposure to the mind the highest reality re elevates the mind, it expands the mind. It helps the mind to grow up. So a mind that is unexposed to the ultimate reality, it gets caught in small, small things. Oh, oh, I want to watch this cricket match. I want to watch that movie. Oh, that person spoke like this. How terrible. That person spoke like this. My mood is ruined now. I can't do anything. So small pleasures tempt and agitate us and small problems threaten and agitate us. And the characteristic of a small mind is that it is disturbed by small things. A small mind makes small things very big. I earlier started by talking about unfit mind is what? Its perception is distorted. So distorted perception means small things, we make them very big. So that is what happens when the mind has not grown up. For a child, the breaking of a toy is the worst thing in the world. But as a child grows up, yeah, breaking of a toy is not a good thing. But it's not the worst thing in the world. The child understands that. So like that, as we grow, as, our, as we expose our mind to the highest reality, to Krishna, to, in the, as described in the Bhakti tradition, then the mind grows up. It starts understanding that there are bigger things in life. You know, we are bigger than our situations. We are bigger than the emotions that are induced within us by those situations. And that understanding helps us to face life with a greater maturity. So, Abhyasa is repeatedly 
exposing the mind to the higher reality, the, specifically the highest reality, Krishna. And that will help the mind to grow up. And then the other part is Vairagya. So what does Vairagya mean? Again, let's look at this. Vairagya means two things. Yeah. Yeah. Detachment. So one aspect of it is stay away from the things that captivate or agitate the mind. An implication too is we need to be detached from the outer objects, but we need to be detached from our own expectation from the mind. I'll explain these two things. That say parents are taking care of a child. When they're taking care of the child, at that time, what happens is that if the child has some fondness for chocolates, then if the parents keep a hundred chocolates in the child's toy room, what will happen is the child doesn't have a sense of perspective. The child may eat not one or two or five or ten. The child may eat all the hundred chocolates. And that would be terrible for the teeth and for the health of the child. So it's the important responsibility of the parents to not keep those chocolates accessible to the child. The child may say, no, I want chocolates. The parents have to have the maturity. No, you cannot have them. So detachment means don't expose the mind to stimuli that agitated. So if the parents keep the chocolates in the child's playroom, where the child spends most of the time, and the parents sell the chocolate. No, parents sell the child, not the chocolate. Parents sell the child, don't eat the chocolate. No, every time the child will see the chocolate, I want it. I said, no, I want it, I want it. No, no. The child will become annoyed, the child will become angry. So why keep the chocolates in the child's playroom? Keep them somewhere else. So like that, the best way to deal with temptation is to not deal with temptation. We have many more important things to do in life. So create some distance, create some barrier between us and temptation. In today's world, for example, our temptation may come through, through internet, through social media, through so many options for entertainment and distraction that we have. So create some barriers, create some net, have some net filters, have some apps, whatever is required to minimize the exposure. So that's the first thing. But there's another aspect in detachment. It is not just that the, between the child and the toys, the, we need to create a barrier. But the child, parents also have to make sure that they don't over-expect from the children. So the child is just learning the first alphabets today. The parents can't expect that in one week, the child should be able to speak and write a full sentence. It's going to take time. So sometimes one of the biggest reasons why we are unsuccessful in our attempts to manage our mind, in our attempts to become mindful is we have unrealistic expectations from our mind. We think, today I made a resolution. I will never become angry. And we expect, I give the instruction, I made the resolution, I'm not going to get angry. And from today onwards, I'll never get angry. That's not going to happen like that. It's like we tell child, from today onwards, you should not play with this toy at all. Well, the child has maybe employed child may have been playing with that toy for a long time and just our instruction may not get the child to stop playing the toy. So we have to give up the expectation of quick results. Now, how do we define quick results? For different people, it may be different. Some of us may have some conditionings that may take a few weeks to go. Away. Some of us, some conditionings may take a few months to go. Away. Some conditioning may take several years or even several decades to go away. So we need to be patient. And so the mind going in an unhealthy direction is something which can agitate us. But the mind not going as fast as we want in the healthy direction, that can also agitate us. And that agitates us, again, we, we are no longer mindful. Our perception is not clear. So... These two things in the bhakti tradition, there is vairagya. Vairagya means we understand that we, we distance ourselves from the outer objects, but also we understand that our growth 
does not happen by our efforts alone our growth happens by a higher plan by divine grace and that is that understanding so there is uh, this is the month of damodar which is going on in damodar krishna is tied with two row krishna krishna has been attempted to be tied by mother yashoda but it's difficult and then finally when there are two fingers shot again and again and again finally she is able to tie him so those two two fingers represent human endeavor and divine grace so what that means is if we apply that to our a situation with respect to the mind what is in our capacity is that we try to create as many barriers as possible uh, so that we don't get easily agitated but the pace at which the mind will grow that we can't determine we can't control that the transformation will happen surely but it will take its own time and the readiness to wait for transformation to happen that is humility that is faith and we will be transformed the magic of bhakti of abhyasa in the practice of bhakti is such that each one of us as we chant the holy names as we study the bhagavad gita as we worship the deities we expose ourselves to the ultimate reality krishna we'll find the more we look at the ultimate reality the more when we look at the world we'll be able to see things clearly if somebody is trying to manipulate us we will have the clarity to say okay this person is trying to manipulate me over here now if we are ourselves overreacting to some situation just that have you connected ourselves with krishna and the mind starts overreacting so i'm getting hyperventilating getting angry oh no maybe i'm overreacting over here we calm down we will become better observers of our mind and better restrainers and redirectors of our mind and that is how once our mind becomes our friend like a parent i conclude with this parenting metaphor now as i'll talk about the modes and mood in the last part so that is over that is in this connection the gita talks about three modes sattva rajas tamas goodness passion and ignorance so in goodness the mind perceives clearly in passion the mind perceives only the objects of his desire in ignorance the mind just gets lost in imagination in illusion in delusion it doesn't it doesn't perceive in material reality properly what to speak of perceiving spiritual reality so that is what is the challenge but fortunately whatever mode when may be in the mood is changeable so our minds moods will change again and again but I, so we can't control the moods of our mind sometimes we we'll feel energetic sometimes we we'll feel lethargic sometimes we we'll feel optimistic sometimes we we'll feel pessimistic these moods will keep coming and keep going but if we try to elevate our mood if we try to live as much as possible in sattva guna have a regulated time for waking and sleeping have a regulated time for eating food have good friends around us cultivate overall a healthy way of living and we do that we will find the mood will rise mood which you are living will rise as we rise towards sattva guna we will find automatically the moods will become less wildly swinging and more steady so rather than worrying about our moods you know i'm doing this why is the mood swinging like this why do i feel so good at one moment and then i so bad at the next moment don't worry about it is focus on elevating the mode in which we are living overall and the mode the mind's mood will grow up now if parents start worrying in the for after every mood of the child the now the children are fickle but as long as the parents are taking due care of the children the children will grow up and they will outgrow their fickleness so we focus not on the mood of the mind but the mode of our living the emotions and the mind is subtle it's very difficult to deal with it but it's much easier to focus on the physical level and reorganize the physical level and when you do that the psychological level will automatically change so i'll conclude with this application 
you know, in wherever you are staying, in your home, in your work, in your workplace, what you do is try to see if you can create one corner of satuguna. Satuguna means maybe in your home, have a small altar, or have your own private space where you may have some good pictures, have some thoughtful quotes, have a device ready where you can have some soothing music. We have some incense, something which gives nice fragrance. Basically, have a place which can immediately direct our thoughts towards Satvaguna, raise our consciousness towards goodness. Have one place of beauty, of serenity, of, of sanctity, wherever we are. And when we do that, we'll find that just holding that place close to us, play, holding ourselves in that place, going there and staying there, even for a few minutes, will help us deal with the mind's moves. By creating a Saptaguni situ atmosphere, as it is possible for us, we'll find that the mind's fluctuations, the mind's moodiness, it won't affect us so much. And eventually, mind's moodiness itself will go down. And the mind becomes our friend, then it is becoming like two for one. Sometimes uh, when, we, when we buy one product in sales, what happens is they say that you buy this product and get this free. Mm -hmm. So, so for, for us, it will become like that. Now, right now we are one and we are dealing with the world's problems, but we are also dealing with our mind's problems. So half our energy or more than half of energy is going with respect to dealing with the mind. And we have the only remaining little energy to deal with the world. But as our mind grows up, it's like a parent who is carrying a naughty child constantly and they have to carry the naughty child and take attention to the naughty child and also have to deal with, maybe do their job. Like sometimes mothers, they go to a place in, the, in traditional places, they may say, mother's carrying the baby in their hands and the mother is maybe selling some vegetables or doing something like that. It's difficult. They're doing two things at the same time. But the child grows up Child becomes young, young, strong person, and the child can help the mother. The child can carry heavy substances, heavy objects, place them here, place them there, and then that one becomes two, and the force becomes doubled that way. So as we help our mind to grow up, the mind becomes our friend, and when the mind becomes our friend, we will be able to function far more effectively. We will surprise ourselves with how many things we are able to do in how little time. And not just do things, do better things, but become a better being. That is the stage where Krishna says that the mind has become our friend and our life has become successful. Our potentials are manifested and our destiny is fulfilled. So I'll summarize. I spoke today about mindfulness based on Bhagavad Gita. I talked about three main points. First was metaphors for understanding the mind. I talked about three broad metaphors. So the mind is like a tool. The body, if you can say the tool for moving and going here and there, the mind is a tool for perceiving. So the mind can be either fit. When there is clear perception, it can be unfit. When there is distorted perception and it can be sick when there is toxic perception. That means there is a small problem and we see it as a small problem. That's the fit mind. When you see a small problem, when there's a small problem, we see it as a big problem. That is a distorted mind. And there's a small problem and we think, oh, this is my ruination. My life is destroyed now. That is a toxic mind. So another, met another metaphor was the mind is like the pathway through which the light of consciousness comes out. That same example, the mind is a tool, but how is it? it's like a passageway through which the light comes out. Then another metaphor we discussed was the mind is like a child. And that was the metaphor in the second part. So how do we manage the mind? That is Abhyasa and Vairagya. When the child needs to be taken care of so that the child grows up. And that requires feeding and fencing. Feeding is Abhyasa, fencing is Vairagya. And what does feeding mean for the mind? That the, the more we expose the mind to the biggest reality, the faster the mind becomes big. It grows up. The size of the mind depends on the size of the object within the mind, the size of thoughts in the mind. 
and bhakti yoga provides us ready ready access to the ultimate reality and that helps the mind to grow up the fastest and then so that's abhyas and vairagya is two things the parents make sure that things that may agitate or distract the child they are not in the child's child's horizon keep them far away so distance ourselves from the objects that may agitate or captivate our mind and the second is the parents have to be detached from the expectation of instant success instant growth children will grow at their pace so we don't have to think that oh i made this solution i didn't succeed that's why everything is over no things will grow at their pace so be patient so when we do have this to understand the attachment we can help the mind to grow up rapidly i need to talk to, concluding about the modes and how we can go beyond the modes through the practice of bhakti so the modes we can't change them we can't very much control the moods of our mind it is flicker flickering and fickle but we can change the mood in which we are living if we create even a small shelter of satvaguna of higher consciousness around us wherever we are then by just by going there physically we can change the frame of our mind and help it to become more elevated and when the mind becomes our friend we we become like one for two we one become two like a mother with a grown child helping her so similarly the mind with as our friend will empower us to function much more effectively not just to better things but become a better beings thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or comments yes bal ganesh pro Hare Krishna Prabhu, Sadhana Prana Prabhu. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, Prabhu. Actually, I have two questions, Prabhu. The first one is sometimes we'll be surprised to see the sudden, uh, uh, sudden change in the drastic difference of moods, Prabhu. Sometimes, yeah, we will cultivate Satguna, but somehow or other, uh, suddenly we will jump to Tamaguna. So within very minute fraction of seconds. So uh, we are unable to perceive. Uh, what does it impact uh, to for those sudden shifts so my second question is uh, when we die uh, okay, wait a minute let's take one question yeah, sure yes, so when the modes change suddenly we are not able to perceive the cause well the mind is subtle and the way it's affected is not so easy to perceive like uh, sometimes a person gets infected by a disease some people sometimes we can find out okay you know the infection came from here so then the infection came from there so like some diseases like malaria or something we know it's come from mosquito but if you consider cancer it's difficult to know what exactly caused the cancer some people may say it's a pollution of the atmosphere well if that was the case then everybody should get cancer everybody doesn't sometimes uh, there are diseases which we can't really trace their cause but then we focus on the cure as much as we can so to the extent it so when when our minds moods changes or the the desires the emotion they change rapidly if we can find the cause well and good but if we can't find the cause well okay that's fine we just focus on the mind has gone towards tamaguna let me try to get it towards a higher mode so don't spend too much time analyzing if no immediate cause is apparent because sometimes the cause may be just some impressions within the mind rising up suddenly rohpal gives the example that sometimes if a water is calm we may throw a stone and the water gets restless but sometimes the water may is maybe calm and there are no stones thrown from outside but some kind of fermentation is happening below and suddenly bubbles start coming up from above from below to above and the water starts becoming restless so sometimes it might just be something from our subconscious mind or we could say from the pure samskaras rising up so don't focus so much on the cause focus more on the solution on the cure just do what what we know helps us to rise towards higher mode towards goodness and towards sattva guna toward and do that and that that's how we'll deal with it okay bro yeah can i ask another question we'll come back to you again sure bro sure 
So Harshil was asking how to overcome phobias, mental blocks. Well, phobias are sometimes uh, it depends. In the word sometimes we use the phobia in a conversational sense. Sometimes we use in a in a pathological sense. That means medical sense. Sometimes we can't. We may not be able to change our phobias. Uh, but what we can do is we can change our attitude towards our phobias. If we suddenly feel very fearful about something, so rather than beating ourselves up for feeling fearful or demanding that we should feel fearful, okay, I feel fearful, but what can I do about it now? So try to if we if we may not be able to control the mind's reaction, but we can control our response to the mind's reaction. So what we do is we gradually deal with it. It's like somebody has a very great claustrophobia. They just can't enter into a lift, for example, an elevator, so they want to go, they want to rise up. So what do they do? Okay. So gradually, step by step, the phobia states. That means okay, you cannot go to the elevator. You cannot enter the elevator. But can you take two steps towards the elevator? Um, can you take two steps towards the elevator? Yeah, two is possible. Can you take two more steps? Yeah. Can you take two more? Uh, not today. Okay. That's good. You take two to four steps. So basically, gradually, be patient. Whatever causes the phobia, don't expect or demand that that fear go away. But just see how much you can push yourself. And little pushes also, they may be insignificant from the world's perspective, but they are very significant from our perspective. And by gradual, step by step, we will be able to minimize the effect. So the mind imagines, oh, if this happens, if a spider comes, the spider will kill me. And the spider can't kill you. But you tell that logically it doesn't work. So what happens is, whatever the stimulus, slowly increase our tolerance to that. And then we'll ask and see, oh, I went, so I went right to the door of the lift and nothing bad happened. Yeah, maybe my fear is not that bad. Something to me, uh, that, that bona fide. Let me enter into the lift once. So gradually, step by step, we deal with the phobias. Yes. Okay, so we have, yes, Gail. Hi, Krishna Prabhu. Hare. Yeah, um, you have said that we have to be patient with our practice. Um, we shouldn't, you know, so there's also, we have to have the humility to wait on Krishna's grace, right? When we're trying yes. to improve in some area of our life. So as we're practicing and um, let's say maybe results aren't coming as fast as we would like, how do we understand whether we just need to be more patient on Krishna's grace or we need to step up our practice or, you know, or see that maybe there's something lacking on our side? Mm. So how do we know whether there's something lacking on our side or it's just that we have to be patient for Krishna's grace? Well, the two don't have to be uh, contradictory. They can be parallel. We keep taking inventory to see whether there's anything more I can do. And at the same time, we wait for Krishna also. So it's like we are waiting and while we are waiting, we are working. So if you consider from a, a from the perspective of Bhakti Shila Prabhupada was trying to share Krishna Bhakti in India. He was, this didn't work. He tried that. This didn't, he tried first to write a magazine and people not interested. Then he tried to work with his God family, God brothers. It didn't work. Then he tried to have his own temple. That didn't work. And he got a Bhagavatam written and he got good endorsements, but he didn't get beyond that much. He kept trying. And then he came to America and then there also financial things did work, but eventually things took off. So the idea is that 
what is in what is in our endeavor we keep trying to be resourceful so if we are trying to chant and we find ourselves getting distracted so we try to take inventory you know how can i help myself focus maybe keeping a picture of my spiritual master can help maybe having some uh, some some maybe incense in my atmosphere having some tulsi in my atmosphere can help so we try from what we can at the same time we wait wait on krishna so both both factors go together and rather than thinking that am i being too harsh with myself or am i being too lenient with myself just focus on doing what we can and adapting it's just like if we were in a career we are having our career we are having our we were trying to grow actively in our career we would be constantly looking what what is something new i can learn is there some more networking i can do we are all waiting for that lucky break that can change our career but we just don't sit passively in our house waiting for lucky break we do what we can we try to develop connections and then maybe some lucky break comes up eventually that's how it is thank you baba thank you so if we feel okay uh, shakti ma hari krishna prabhu hari. am i audible yes clearly a uh, prabhu i have borderline personality disorder which i have um um see i'm unable to mingle with people have good friends because whenever i i mingle with people and try to develop friend friendship with them i feel exploited how to overcome this and how to have a good friends because i may whole year whole life so far i don't have um, only one or two friends i have how to yeah how to make tough. friends yeah it's tough you know if we if you feel that having friends means we'll get exploited so first thing is that every fear has a cause so we can't control that emotion if you feel fear if you feel apprehension if you feel hesitation that emotion is something if when we try to when we try to fight against our emotions it's like we are setting ourselves up for a losing battle hmm? that is what we can do is we can focus on our actions we can focus on our intelligence so sometimes the best way to fight an enemy is to dodge their main flank if in this side the enemy is very strong then don't fight that side go your side and fight from some other flank so if some emotion is very strong for us then instead of trying to combat that emotion we focus on things other than the emotion we focus on action we focus on reason so okay that emotion is present i i fear that i'll be exploited okay that's fine but okay within that fear does that mean i can't do anything like right now you came for this talk and you asked a question so that is something which you can people of doing so rather than thinking when will this fear go away we we'll focus on okay within whatever the constraints imposed by that fear what can i do what action can i take what level of reasoning can i do now when you say you know oh by my reasoning i understand i should not have that fear no don't don't attack that fear right now okay with that reasoning yeah you know this person has always been quite kind to me so maybe i can take a few steps through this person and see how they reciprocate so see we may have to live with fear but we don't have to live in fear sometimes what happens is we try to get rid of the fear and then it doesn't go away and we feel discouraged live with fear means see that each of us see we all have different issues some of us may have physical issues some of us may have a scar on our body some of us may have some some particular thing in with our physical level all of us have to live with some issues but we don't have to live consumed by the thoughts of those we don't have to live in that 
we don't have to let ourselves be defined or identified by that. So accept that it is there, but act on other folks and you'll find, act on other fronts. And over a period of time, you'll find that gradually bonding will happen. So like I said, the best way to deal with temptation is to not deal with temptation. The best way to deal with uh, a negative emotion is to not deal with that negative emotion. It's very difficult to reason with strong negative emotions. But we can use reason for some, some, other, you know, some other constructive direction. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. So one last question and we'll stop here. So how can we deal with depression when uh, if some when when, when feels when a lost meaning in life? See, meaning is not like a one zero thing, like digital electronics. Oh, this thing was giving me meaning, now this thing is gone, all meaning is lost. Meaning can also be created in increments, it's analog. So, okay, in this situation in my life, there are two choices for me. I can sit on my bed and watch TV all day or I can go out and maybe do something for someone. We can just maybe speak a few kind words to someone. So, rather than thinking of finding a whole meaning for life when that has been lost, simply focus on finding some small thing which gives meaning. Okay, maybe you know, speaking a few kind words to someone that makes me feel that I did something meaningful. I did something good. So start with start with a small state of me, a small meaning, and that will gradually build up. That's the best way for us to move forward in the search for meaning. Don't wait for one or zero. Don't don't worry about the big loss loss of big meaning. Start with small, and small things will grow. And sometimes, or we may find that. The, the loss of a smaller meaning, or well, we may not think that meaning is smaller, but the loss of a smaller meaning may actually be the pathway to open for a bigger meaning. So, the clouds look so beautiful in the sky. And we think, oh, now the sky looks so beautiful. And when the clouds break, hey, oh, the beautiful cloud is all broken up. But from the beautiful break, the breaking of the beautiful clouds, the rains come. And whereas the clouds may just serve like an ornamental purpose in the sky, the rains serve an essential purpose. They nourish life on the earth. So similarly, the soil looks uh, nice when it is uh, natural. But when you have to plow it, you have to put a plow through it, it it's, it the cracks of the initial doesn't look very good. Soil has to be broken so that grains come out of it. Crops grow from it. So often our, what we conceive as meaning is broken so that some higher meaning will be revealed. So we just need to wait. And we wait and we watch. So, and we, so two things, we find meaning where we can and we wait for some bigger meaning to emerge and it will gradually. Okay. So, thank you very much for joining today and uh, wish you all the very best. May Krishna guide you from within and without to better manage the mind and become more and more mentally healthy. Hare Krishna.